Hello, everybody. My name is um, Lin Mario Menezes de Souza from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And here I'm um, going to say a couple of things about interculturality within the general problematic of uh, internationalization in higher education. Well, as you may know, international of higher education at the moment is marked by huge and constant south north flows of students, researchers, and knowledge. Various researchers have talked about this, for example, Margins in Alper and Alpac, Knight, Divit, etc. Internationalization as such is subject to planetary hegemonic globalization, which as Boaventura Santos proposes, involves the local of the more powerful becoming globalized in an unequal and unjust top-down manner. These south-north flows of students, researchers, and knowledges are inseparable also from the post-productive financial capitalism of neoliberalism, with its celebrated end of national borders and supposedly end of delimited national spaces, where the market becomes the key word, the buzzword, the norm and motive for all and everything. Within this scenario, internationalization policies in higher education revolve around what I consider to be three main issues. The linguistic issue, the presupposition of the un uncontested cultural capital of the English language. The interculturality issue, which is supposedly resolved by the language issue and is therefore largely ignored. It's a presuppose that to interact with anyone from a different culture, all you need in the present circumstances is to speak English. And thirdly, the decolonial issue. And this involves the fact that historical inequalities and injustices of modernity, coloniality, reflect, maintain, and possibly challenge, I think we should challenge, the global flows, the global south-north flows of students, researchers, and knowledge. So the decolonial issue for me uh, um, is something which uh, includes the linguistic issue and the interculturality issue. It's if we don't understand the continuing effects of colonization on our relations with other cultures and on uh, what makes the English language predominant in the current scenario, and so important in the process of internationalization, then uh, we are not going to get very far in understanding the whole issue, and this will not permit us to challenge it. Okay, so decolonial, decolonial theories in general question the prevalent modernity coloniality paradigm. And this is a paradigm that establishes a hierarchical difference between knowledges and non knowledges universal science and local knowledge, and between superior people seen as fully human and inferior peoples who are seen as less than human. If the modernity coloniality issue is not addressed and interrupted, I think we will continue to see the naturalization of South-North flows in internationalization and the uncontested hegemony of English and of the knowledges of the Global North, to the detriment, of course, of those of the Global South, our own. In this scenario, internationalization signifies the continuation of the global paradigm of inequality and social injustice. Boaventura Santos believes that there cannot be social justice without cognitive or epistemic justice. However, I believe it is not just an epistemological issue of trying to bring more knowledges, including those previously excluded by the colonial paradigm, to the table. For me, it's a question of who owns the table, who does the inviting to the table, and who is considered eligible to be invited. This change from the what of knowledges to the who, and here I mean the produce of knowledges, transforms the issue from one of epistemology to one of ontoepistemology. By changing the scenario from an apparently neutral one of a table and people sitting around it, as Habermas would would have it, to one of ownership of the table and the capacity to elicit and accept invitations, 
one brings the political aspect into the picture. Who has the power of decision and why? So why are we seeing these flows from the south to the north and not the opposite? This political aspect is inseparable from the intercultural aspect. For me, therefore, it's important to understand the intercultural problematic on which internationalization is based in order to interrogate and interrupt the uncritical south-north flows of internationalization. But first, I think a few words on multiculturality uh, or multiculturalism are in order. Multiculturalism begins from what I consider to be a convergent hegemonic desire for a singular cohesive nation marked by unitary social cohesion or one single culture. This cohesion is often seen to have once existed but has been lost. So multiculturalism, as we've seen it occurring in the last uh, few decades, generally applies to multi multiculturalism, the coexistence of cultures and languages within the boundaries of a specific nation. So from the same convergent perspective, given the supposedly lost homogeneity of the nation, one perceives the cultural differences among the different groups now constituting the space of the nation. Um, it is these differences which come to the fore rather than any similarity or conviviality. The juxtaposed separateness of different supposedly homogeneous minority cultural groups within the nation is seen to pose a potential and constant threat of conflict and clash, given that none of the groups is seen as having anything in common with each other, nor with the governing minority, uh, majority. This attitude of the governing majority, this attitude of suspicion um, of minorities, of cultural minorities, engenders national policies to, or encourages national policies to defuse and prevent clashes and maintain cohesion with diversity. This maintaining cohesion with diversity is understood as the coexistence of multiple homogeneities. It's, it's a bit like perceiving languages as separate homogeneous un, units. They are not, but this is what people imagine them to be. Nations are also perceived as single homogeneous units. And so groups of immigrants within a nation that constitute a nation are also, each group is also perceived as homogeneous. And so we have this desire for cohesion, which comes from, um, in my, in my uh, understanding, uh, a misperceived, uh, misperceived cohesion and misperceived existing cohesion in nations. They don't exist, but this is what it's, it's presupposed. So multicultural policies tend to move from economic and political distribution to cultural recognition. You may have be familiar with the work of uh, Kim Licker and Nancy Fraser. But these proposals still maintain in my perspective a coloniality stance of hierarchy of the majority group. It's as if it is the majority group of the nation which is looking at the minorities. In some cases, this evolves to a convergent interculturality. Ted Cantor speaks of this in relation to the United Kingdom. In order to recuperate social cohesion, um, when, it, when it is perceived to be under threat, policies to promote encounters between the different minority groups are, are promoted. In the European community, for example, interculturality is seen from this convergent perspective seeking cohesion. Um, convergent perspective is a, also a perspective of assimilation, a perspective of reducing the many to the one. Interculturality as convergence then in general seeks to diffuse the possibility of clashes between cultures by promoting encounters, communication and mutual understanding, but cannot abandon a separatist concept of culture, meaning it still tends to see cultures as being separable units. 
it has great difficulty in understanding cultures as intermeshed, entangled beings, dynamic elements which borrow and lend to each other. So interculturality as convergence loses itself in strategies which aim at mutual understanding and communication, which are frustrated by the founding precept of separability and difference being substantive. So they seek mutual understanding. But when it departs from, a, when these proposals depart from a presupposition that groups are substantially different, it's very difficult for them to achieve mutual understanding without an elimination of the specific characteristics of these minority groups. Then the understanding, rather than being mutual, is something which is imposed. So like multiculturalism, convergent interculturality is also based on a politics of cultural recognition, but can Considering that it aims at mutuality and convergence, this recognition of difference is temporary and transitional. So convergent interculturality by aiming at mutuality and convergence, and at the same time wanting to recognize difference, this difference is only recognized at the beginning because it's assumed that during the process of communication with these others, these others of other minorities constitution constituting the nation, this difference will be reduced. Whose difference will be reduced? Obviously, the difference in of the characteristics of the minority cultures. So this is a process, in other words, of assimilation. So mutuality, again, occurs by eliminating the difference of the other and reducing the difference of the other to the similarity or the identity of um, the hegemonic, the majority, the more powerful. In Latin America, interculturality is preferred to multiculturalism, where indigenous populations are concerned. Uh, interculturality is understood in official policies of education to mean that um, indigenous cultures are recognized, that um, therefore, if indigenous cultures are recognized in official policies, then presumably uh, policies of economic and political redistribution are occurring. This is not normally the case. And unfortunately, when interculturality is emphasized among especially policies of indigenous education in here in Brazil or in other places of Latin America, it is the minorities who have to be intercultural and not the white majority. The white majority continues in its monocultural, monolinguistic stance. It's the indigenous minorities who have to be uh, um, bilingual and intercultural. This makes these policies largely innocuous to the non-indigenous majority of these nations. They are the ones who have to be intercultural, not us. However, some indigenous groups do seek to connect cultural recognition, recognition with demands for economic and political redistribution. Catherine Walsh, for example, makes a distinction between functional interculturality, which refers to official convergent policies of recognition as transitional to assimilation, and critical interculturality, which assumes a non-convergent stance and is promoted by indigenous activists who demand recognition but refuse assimilation. So, Continuing on this discussion of non-convergent interculturality, from the now non-dominant, non-hegemonic perspective, no longer desirous of a cohesive unitary nation, cultures are not seen as homogeneous and separate. Cultures are seen from the perspective of the minority, the non-hegemonic. Cultures are seen as internally heterogeneous, because they have the conscience, consci uh, co uh, consciousness and the awareness that they, are, they have to borrow from the majority culture. So for them, cultures are seen as internally heterogeneous and both internally and externally entangled 
with the other cultures that surround them in terms of histories, and especially the histories of coloniality and modernity. This entanglement is inserted within the inequalities and injustice of coloniality. And it seemed to be invisible on the part of the hegemonic. They don't see the entanglement, they see the separability. Their coloniality leads them to see themselves as superior and therefore demand assimilation and convergence to their values. They may speak of the, the need for, as I said before, the need for mutual intelligibility, but they will see uh, the mutuality of this intelligibility as simply transitional because at the end of the process, they want only their values and their knowledges to be the ones that um, are existing. The stage is then set in debates of interculturality for the confrontation between convergent and non-convergent forms of interculturality. In the current paradigm of globalization, we are witnessing the re-emergence of cosmopolitanism. Remember that word? Cosmopolitanism, which came from Kant, perhaps, originally. Cosmopolitanism, which emphasize, emphasizes international connections and tends to reaffirm an engagement with a universalized human equality across national borders. So it presupposes, presupposes a common humanity across no, national borders. In this sense, cosmopolitanism seeks convergence across cultural difference. However, this form of cosmopolitanism ignores the coloniality modernity issue and the inequalities and injustices that coloniality reflects. And therefore, cosmopolitanism doesn't address the fact that some nations are considered to possess knowledge worthy of exchange, whereas others are not. The issue then is not of exchange, but of inequality of value or worth. Examples of this in internationalization is the lack of South-South exchanges, as the knowledges of the North are seen to, be, to have more value than those of the South. More recently, several theories have appeared under the term cosmopolitical, in opposition to cosmopolitanism, they propose the term cosmopolitical. These theories question cosmopo the cosmopolitan universalized common sense and its presupposition of multiculturalism and mononaturalism. All of these presuppositions which underlie cosmopolitanism as the important thing being the one among the many. The cosmopolitical proposals demand, on the contrary, the deconstruction and reconstruction of the world from the perspective of the heterogeneous forces and entities that inhabit it. They don't seek convergence. They seek the necessity to coexist, understanding the lack of convergence or the non-existence of convergence. So they, rather than desiring the one out of the many, they seek to they seek the the understanding of what does it mean to live as one of the many, where the many are maintained, not reduced to one. The only point that cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitics have in common is that they both address the difficulty of coexisting in the world. Whereas cosmopolitanism assumes a convergent, and I've said multicultural, mononatural world, I'll explain that in a minute, in which despite cultural differences, humans have identical needs because they are equally and only human. That is no other kind of subject living subject is taken into account, only humans. That is what cosmopolitanism presupposes. Cosmopolitics, on the other hand, assumes a non-convergent, multinatural, meaning involving different species, multinatural and intercultural perspective, 
in which the presupposed sameness among, among interlocutors does not exist. So interlocutors in interculturality from a cosmopolitical perspective are probably not going to be the same beings and therefore not have similar languages and not have overlapping in, in meanings and all of this will make communication difficult and mutual intelligibility almost an impossibility. So the interlocutors here from a cosmopolitical perspective may be of various species, including the more than human. So the cosmopolitical perspective calls our attention to the fact that elements of nature from for particular for certain cultures, elements of nature may be um, may have as strong a subjectivity as human beings. They may also be able to speak, understand, and react. Thus, non-convergent cosmopolitics questions presuppositions as to what can be considered as human, or even what can be considered as a thinking, speaking subject, and therefore eligible for subjecthood rights and citizenship. Also, whereas for cosmopolitanism, interculturality involves attaining mutual intelligibility, for cosmopolitics, interculturality involves a process of ongoing, persistent attempts at communication, perceived as slow, difficult, and this largely implies in understanding that one does not or cannot understand. So what we see here are two basic models of intercultural communication, a convergent dialogue, mutual intelligibility model versus a non-convergent communication, communicating otherwise model. Of the two models, one has a focus on dialogue as a step towards mutual understanding and therefore convergence. So dialogue, we will understand each other um, as we speak. That's the con concept of dialogue. This focus on mutual understanding and convergence presupposes the standard concept of communication as the transference of meaning. This model fits into the paradigm of cosmopolitanism. The other model of intercultural communication seeks an alternative non-convergent concept of communication otherwise or communication as always difficult and problematic. It focuses on differences which impede mutual understanding. Here, no point of convergence is assumed in intercultural communication. On the contrary, the lack of possible convergence and the differences that hinder mutual understanding emphasize, ironically, the need for the impetus to ethically constantly pursue this mutual understanding through other means, apart from con convergence and overlap. So here we have, in this non-convergent form of interculturality, the understanding that we don't understand each other, ironically, brings the impetus, the ethical imperative to continue to try to understand each other. It doesn't presuppose understanding from the, or, or the possibility of understanding but it does presuppose the necessity to enter into communication with one's other. The need for this impetus or this imperative to communicate with one, one's other stems from the ethical need to live together on the same planet without destroying each other or the planet. So whereas the previous model, the convergent model of dialogue, uh, mutual understanding, sought convergence in communication and attends to the paradigm of cosmopolitanism, the second model which focuses on difference and non-convergence in communication otherwise attends to the paradigm of cosmopolitics. Okay, so now let's have a look at the non-convergent intercultural proposal of cosmopolitics. Okay, and here we're going to get into really the concept of cosmopolitics as proposed by the Belgian thinker Isabel Stanger. So firstly, when we look at other cultures, where are we looking from? 
Are we looking from a presupposed universality of our knowledge, our science? Do we assume that our knowledge and our science are the only knowledges and the only science available? Or are we looking at other cultures from the perspective of the colonial difference and the modernity coloniality paradigm that organizes knowledges and peoples as not equal and hierarch hierarchically different? Are we looking at one same world seen from different perspectives as the relativists would like? Or are we looking at different worlds with different conceptions of knowledge and people? The cosmopolitical proposal says that we are looking at different, from different perspectives where we don't even agree on what our concept of the same would be. So for Isabel Stonger, the Belgian, as I said, the Belgian thinker who proposes the term cosmopolitics, we need to critically consider the fact that we naturalize the application of theories and the analysis of objects. These processes are culture specific and not natural. So the way we see the world will depend in short uh, on the theories that we're using, the bibliographies and the libraries that we frequent. By engaging in them, in our theories, we forget our location in particular cultural, political, and historic spaces. By doing this, by forgetting our specific situatedness, we attribute a certain unquestioned authority to the theories that we use. As these theories lead us to see the world in the same way that they see it, these theories have huge political clout or impact. These theories naturalize one way of seeing the world and thus promote convergence and universality of perception against diversity. They propose a politics of convergence in which divergence should be overcome rather than a politics of divergence in which a coming together of different elements provokes necessary negotiation, discussion, disagreement, and a perception that Quite likely, non-understanding is as, is as important as understanding. The cosmopolitical proposal that Isabel Stangers offers, in my opinion, an opportunity to think interculturality from a non-convergent, non-assimilative, non-cosmopolitan, even decolonial perspective. For Stangers, the cosmos in cosmopolitical refers not to a physical space, astrological, astronomic space. It refers to a concept. It refers to the occurrence of not knowing, not understanding, not collaborating when different elements, beings, languages, peoples come into contact. So it refers to this possibility of non-overlap non-coincidence that is always present um, in all kinds of uh, social, intercultural, linguistic contacts, but we don't think it through. The occurrence of not knowing, not understanding, not collaborating, it, when our interlocutor doesn't want to speak back to us, when our interlocutor does not want to collaborate, when our interlocutor doesn't understand. So all of these occurrences are part of this space, this conceptual space, which he calls the cosmos, this possibility of the occurrence of the unexpected. So this questions then the naturality of the assumption that understanding, knowing, and collaboration are the only possibilities of responding to interaction. Indifference, silence, and non-comprehension are also natural responses. They also should be taken into account in intercultural context. It proposes then, here we're talking about the cosmopolitical proposal, it proposes that there is no shared basis from which one can think other cultures and other knowledges through. For Stanger, to think the cosmos, that space of non-overlap, 
To think the cosmos implies opening oneself to radical difference, opening oneself to thinking of equality as non-equivalent difference, non-identical difference, with no claims to establishing a similarity. It proposes a non-convergent equality. Stangaitya, just to make it clear, she makes a, a disti distinction between equality, meaning uh, at a qualitative aspect, the same in terms of quality, and equivalence at a numerical mathematical aspect. So equivalence is almost saying that we are identical to each other, whereas equality would say that we are equal in our worth, but may not be identical. So to think this cosmos, for Stongel, is to frighten our certainties into action or reaction, to frighten our sense of universality, which we have through our modernity, coloniality paradigm, we have been, we have inherited and we have thought, uh, we have assumed as natural. It contributes to the important intercultural <laughs> perception that we could be wrong and mistaken in our understanding. It is important to remember that each language, each culture, each form of knowledge is incomplete and in the unending process of construction. The cosmopolitical assumption that there is no shared basis on which communication can be based is highly significant for interculturality. So given the cosmopolitical assumption of the lack of a shared basis of understanding, the demand for translation rather than dialogue arises. And here Boaventura Santos proposes what he calls intercultural translation as a possibility. He says that given the diversity of the world and its knowledges, there's no sense in attempting to grasp the world by any single general theory. This would be looking for a basis of common understanding, or looking for a commonality, a substantive commonality below difference or behind difference. Any single general theory will always convergently presuppose what he calls the monoculture of a given totality and the homogeneity of its parts. The alternative to a single general theory is a possibility that establishes that all knowledges and cultures are incomplete and need to be translated. This is very similar to Stanger's proposal of frightening our certainties, frightening our presupposition of completeness. So we need translation. Santos is telling us we need translation because we're no culture, no language is complete. So to overcome the continued imposition of singularities through coloniality, the incompleteness of one, one's own knowledge and culture can only be unleashed and understood in translation with another knowledge and culture. It's only when we are in an intercultural encounter with someone from a radically different culture that we perceive that uh, um, we can't understand and they can't understand. So there is incompleteness on both sides. The objective, therefore, is not to achieve completeness and substitute one universal for another. Because completeness is admittedly unattainable. But on the contrary, in this kind of intercultural contact, the objective is to raise mutual the consciousness of mutual incompleteness to maximus, maximum awareness, to raise mutual incompleteness to maximum awareness by way of a dialogue that is carried out. And he says here, yeah, as if we have one foot in one culture and the other in another. He calls this diatopic um, hermeneutics. So we, have, we are never complete. We have one foot in one culture and one in another. But this is the, where we could begin to try and understand our incompleteness in our um, entanglement. Translation raises then consciousness 
the awareness of mutual incompleteness to the maximum. For Santos, intercultural translation is also what he calls negative universalism. So what he says that rather than a convergent cosmopolitanism, what we need is a general theory on the impossibility of a general theory. He says, and I quote, we need a negative universalism. Negative universalism would then be a theory on the impossibility of a general theory. Translation as part of negative universalism is a process that allows for mutual intelligibility among the experiences of the world without reducing them to homogeneous entities. So it's not the mutual intelligibility that guarantees com uh, comprehension at the end of the process. It's a mutual in intelligibility which is non-reductive, which there's no guarantee of what we will understand, but there's a feeling that we have engaged with each other and some sort of understanding has occurred. Mutual intelligibility, which is an impetus to intercultural communication rather than a point of arrival. For Santos, translation offers itself as an alternative and not a remedy to the fragmentation and atomization that are the dark side of diversity and multiplicity. So when we tend to think that multiplicity and and we've seen in, as I previously mentioned, and I spoke of multiculturalism, this presupposition that we have separate elements, this fragmentation, atomization of separate languages, separate elements. Translation here is an alternative to this idea of separability because it, um, intercultural translation from Santos's perspective shows us that we are all incomplete. If we are all, all our languages, all our cultures are incomplete, it's because we lend and borrow from each other. We are connected to each other. So if the project, he says, is to promote counter-hegemonic practices that combine other knowledges and do so in a horizontal way and with respect for the identity of every knowledge, an enormous effort of mutual recognition, dialogue and debate will be needed to carry out the task. An enormous effort of mutual recognition, dialogue and debate, similar to um, what Isabel Snanger imagines when she talked about difficult communication, slow communication. The work of translation helps to create what Santos calls a contact zone by identifying what separates and unites the different knowledges involved without canceling out what separates them. We'll see this in a moment from when we talk about Francois Julien's concept of gaps. So what separates doesn't cancel out. For example, Santos gives us the example of the concept of human dignity as a translation for human rights. In some cultures, it's a dignity which is much more important than the concept of rights. Translation will reveal, yes, reciprocal shortcomings, ignorances, and weaknesses. But these reciprocal shortcomings, ignorances, and weaknesses are what will contribute to our mutual understanding of each other. The recognition of these incompletenesses in each body of knowledge is a condition, the condition sine qua non for translation and intercultural dialogue. So for non-convergent cosmopolitical decolonial intercultural dialogue to take place, we have to begin from a presupposition of incompleteness, reciprocal incompleteness. The proposed contact zone is an attitude rather than a space, an attitude towards entangled mutual knowledge and understandings through translation without con canceling conceptual differences. A space Contact zone would be then a space for solidarity, complicity, and common action to emerge, what I consider to be interculturality. So 
this space, which he calls a contact zone, which is more an attitude than a space, is very similar to Stong Isabel Stonger's concept of the cosmos as an attitude towards the non-existence of comprehension and collaboration. It's also the space of solidarity, of openness to difference, the space of interculturality. Now, to further our concept of cosmopolitics and thinking communication otherwise, the Brazilian thinker Eduardo Vives de Castro proposes the concept of equivocal translation. So according to Vives de Castro, what one can learn from indigenous philosophies of the Amazon in Brazil is that contrary to the Western colonially universalized presupposition of multiculturalism, which presupposes that what all species have in common is their human nature, there is also the concept that all species, human or other than human, have the capacity to think, communicate, and produce knowledge. This is multinaturalism, which sees the capacity of thinking, producing knowledge, and communicating as something that all species have. It's not simply human. So whereas multiculturalism presupposes that humanity is what the world has in common, the only difference being culture and language, multinaturalism proposes that the world consists of not just humans, but also beings that are more than human. What all these humans and more than human beings have in common is their capacity to think, communicate, and produce knowledge. Given that these are capacities for producing culture, then all beings, human and more than human, have culture in common. <clears throat> what they don't have in common is their natural forms of being. They may be, some may be human, animal, spirit, plant, etc. So rather than multiculturalism, which presupposes one nature and different cultures, these philosophies propose one culture, a shared capacity to think, communicate, and produce knowledge, and different natures. So here we see cultures for which any species of subject perceives itself and its world in the same way as we perceive ourselves and our world as humans. The work of intercultural translation then is not of discovering the common reference to differing representations, but on the contrary, of making explicit the equivocation in believing that the differences may relate to the same referent. Vives de Castro calls this characteristic of communication in multinaturalist cultures equivocal translation. What in equivocal translation, what we, the whole Objective of translation is not to perceive similarities, but to perceive differences. So it sees communication and dialogue as always difficult, always involve, involving the fact that we and they are never talking about the same thing. So when we said previously that one of the important aspects of intercultural communication as intercultural translation is that it requires a productive attitude towards incompleteness. This is what multinaturalism proposes for communication otherwise. Rather than dialogue converging in mutual understanding, what we see is undergoing, is ongoing mutual translation rather than dialogue, in which what occurs on both sides involved in the translation is a constant process of attempting to reduce equivocation or non-understanding, perceiving and appreciating difference in the process, and above all, perceiving one's own incompleteness and the inefficacy for intercultural communication of assumptions of hegemony, universality, and certainty. So, anti-post and decolonial theories tend to explain the universality implicit in convergent cosmopolitan proposals as an effect of power in which coloniality imposes its own interpretation as universal. And it's this imposition that has to be challenged. However, challenged by what? By an other interpretation also seeking hegemony 
to replace the colonial interpretation? Well, this is what anti, uh, anti-coloniality seeks to do, replace one truth with another. Post-coloniality, on the other hand, seeks to propose other interpretations to challenge and coexist with the previous colonial ones. But it rarely considers the power dimension that could make difficult this proposed coexistence between interpretations. The various decolonial proposals that we have seen in Latin America recently give prominence to the power dimension that makes invisible the interpretations it does not legitimate. These decolonial proposals seek to point to the complicity that connects ours and their interpretations. Some, like the proposals of Santos from his uh, epistemologies of the South theories, propose an ecology in which both their and our knowledges or their and our interpretations may coexist. Some decolonial considerations go beyond the epistemological and point also to the ontological, as I mentioned before. This is the case with the idea of the coloniality of being, which is discussed by, in different terms, by Fanon and Maldonado Torres, in which not just interpretations and knowledges, but also the humanity of peoples are not seen to be of equal worth in intercultural contexts. These, however, rarely go beyond the multicultural and cosmopolitan presuppositions and seem to, in the end, after the elimination of coloniality, assume a point of convergence and universal mutual understanding. So, um, rather than promote the the impression that um, European thinkers are not capable of, um, or European thinkers are necessarily colonial. We have seen the proposal of the Belgian Isabel Stanger, the proposal of uh, uh, Boaventura Santos, the Portuguese thinker. There's also now the proposal of Francois Julien, the French thinker, who thinks beyond Eurocentrism, mononaturalism, multiculturalism, and cosmopolitanism. Francois Julien's thinking shares characteristics with Stonger's cosmopolitics and you know, the need for intercultural translation that Viveris and Santos propose. For Julien, what separates cultures are not identities or differences, but gaps. Yes, gaps. Whereas differences and identities refer to positive elements as if they exist as substances, the gap refers to an interstitial space in which nothing exists but indicates proximity with another. A gap, like a bridge, separates and approximates. It can only be a gap if it's between something. The standard convergent intercultural presupposition is that to promote cultural dialogue, there has to be mutual intelligibility. Remember, we've mentioned this before. However, for mutual intelligibility to exist, Julian suggests we move beyond the concept of the universal of coloniality, where one local value, one local knowledge, one local language becomes more valid than other local values. He suggests we move beyond the industrial concept of the uniform, in which everything is identical and mass produced, where we can't see where the original model of the identical comes from and whose it is. He suggests that we need to arrive at what I consider to be a more decolonial concept of the common, not a common in positive terms, meaning identical and reproducible, but a common in the sense of a shared perception of non-comprehensibility, a shared perception that we don't share sameness. The concept of the common operates with the concept of the gap and the in-between for Julien. The non-existence of identity and difference in positive terms and their replacement with the concept of the gap and the in-between lays bare the tension the tension generating distance between the elements in an intercultural encounter. The gap is the distance that opens up and establishes tension. And establishing this tension activates the in-between 
And it is this in-betweenness that is productive in the sense that it is in this in-betweenness produced by the tensions of the gap that we can understand that we don't understand, that we can understand that we are all incomplete. The concept of the gap brings to our attention the idea of open distance between intercultural interlocutors. Distance again, not difference. This is not a matter of distinctions. The gap sets in tension what it has separated. That tension renders operative the in-between. This is similar to the non-convergent proposals of Vives de Castro, as we have seen, Santos and Stonger. So how does one do intercultural translation from a non-convergent cosmopolitical perspective? For Santos, intercultural translation is based on four presuppositions. Firstly, it needs to be recognized that the desire for universality implies a desire for hegemony. And this needs to be abandoned to perceive interconnectedness in the relational ecology. This desire for hegemony is a desire for wanting only my values, only my meanings to prevail. Secondly, it requires the recognition that all cultures, languages, and knowledges are incomplete and in a constant process of becoming through interaction, through relations with others. Therefore, process of intercultural translation, rather than a relation between complete substances or totalities, must be seen as a relation between incompletenesses in which all participants gain or lose something. Thirdly, in order to facilitate communication otherwise, among the various possibilities that each culture presents, there must be a degree of openness to otherness and the possibility of reciprocity. Fourthly, intercultural translation requires a degree of curiosity, which involves an impulse towards contact with alterity and newness. Finally, in all of these proposals of Boaventura Sosa Santos, for its strategy of communication otherwise to function, cultural premises need to be downgraded to arguments. When held as a premise, something is presupposed as unquestionable and is used as a foundation of arguments. An argument, on the other hand, is made visible in the process of arguing. And in this same process of arguing, it is open to and subject to change through persuasion and argumentation. So in order to counter a desire for hegemony and universalism in intercultural communication, Santa suggests that all premises should be downgraded to arguments and thus open to change. So, What I've tried to show is that distant from the intercultural presuppositions embedded in modernity, coloniality, and which emphasize convergence, but do not explain why convergence has to occur in certain directions and not others, especially in the direction of the hegemonic and the global, there is a possibility to challenge this convergent colonial cosmopolitan model of interculturality. This is a possibility offered by non-convergent intercultural proposals from the cosmopolitical stance, which emphasize the productive difficulty in intercultural communication, the difficulty which by being shared ethically and politically puts all those involved in intercultural communication in equal tension, on an equal footing, something which doesn't happen in current internationalization in higher education with the South-North flows and dependencies that characterize it. Thank you very much.